Hello, everyone. I am very delighted to be joining All Things Open. And I'm going to start sharing my slides. And they should be working straight away. Uh, and as I've been introduced already, I'm going to be talking about Python and Docker and how you can make them work for machine learning, data science context, or data science content. So throughout this uh, presentation, there are a couple of things that I am going to be talking about. First, um, I'm going to give an introduction about the whole Python machine learning scene as of now, like 2020. Then I'm going to move on to Docker for machine learning and data science and how this might be different from using Docker for other things like web applications and such. And finally, well, I'm going to then move on to giving you some best practices, giving you some tips and advice on how you can make the most of Docker uh, when you're working with machine learning, deep learning, data science, or, or data intensive applications. And to close up, I'm going to summarize all of this, give you my top tips um, that I've been curating and accumulating, basically, uh, from working with machine learning for, for a few years now. So what are you uh, going to take away? I've already mentioned what I'm going to be covering. So if you're a beginner, if you're only diving into machine learning or Docker, uh, this presentation will give you an idea on why you might want to integrate Docker and machine learning. If you're intermediate in either of these technologies, whether Python, Docker, machine learning, uh, you're going to take away some best practices for working with all of these tools together. And if you're in advance, I'm also going to be covering some advanced techniques for you to optimize your Docker images and optimize your workflows for your uh, development. And before I move over to the bulk of the presentation, let me introduce myself. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I think this is my second uh, All Things Open, and I, I loved it last year that I was there. Um, so just a bit of background on myself. I love open source and all things data. I've been working with data for re over 10 years now, I'm going to say, like uh, data science, machine learning, all of that. And at the moment, I'm working as a senior developer advocate at Microsoft, where I specialize in all things scientific computing, machine learning. Um, but within machine learning, I mostly focus on end-to-end -end machine learning, which is applying uh, stuff into production, doing uh, R&D, so basically all of, all of the spectrum. I'm also obsessed <laughs> with uh, outrun um, aesthetics, you can tell from my avatar. And I love mechanical keyboards. Also, if any of you want to reach out later after the presentation or anything, you can find me at trailer.dev. And just um, a disclaimer, my dog loves barking while I'm giving talks. I always try to distract her with toys, but I don't think it works. And this is that little creature for those of you that are dog people. These slides are all released by with a CC BY license. So that means that you are free to mix, remix, reuse, and share. And you'll be able to find them at this URL. You can download them or, or check them online. So let's move on into the introduction section uh, of this presentation. And I specifically said that this uh, presentation is going to be focusing on integrating Docker and Python together, but why Python? Um, to start with, Python is a programming language that has been gaining popularity for years and years and years. And I like this graph from the Octoverse. It's like 2019. Um, and you can see that this Python has just been growing steadily. Uh, over the last few years, now Python is the second most popular uh, programming language. And when we dive a, dip, uh, a bit deeper into what people are using Python for, we see a massive growth in all things that are data science, data analysis, uh, machine learning, and deep learning. And a very good indicator of this is the increased numbers um, of different notebooks that you are seeing now everywhere, whether it is GitHub, GitLab, um, 
now a lot of publishers for uh, machine learning or, or science in general, open science, um, also allow folks to provide their code and Jupyter notebooks to supplement their research. And this, this has been um, a continuous trend or like a, rather an exponential trend over the last few years. And every year, the Python Software Foundation runs this um, Python community survey to better understand how folks are using Python, what tools they use with it, uh, and how, like, just to get a picture of the community and the whole programming language uh, as a whole. Um, within last year, as it is 2019, the 2020 survey is taking place right now. So if you use Python, I recommend you go and fill it in. Um, but within the last uh, survey, we can see that data analysis and machine learning are within the top three uses for Python. Um, to have data analysis as first, machine learning at third, and then we have different other uses. Uh, uses. Um, because Python is such a versatile programming language and it's very, very easy to use. I absolute, absolutely love it because you can use it for a variety of things. And I think that is both a blessing and a curse because also a lot of the problems that we face within uh, managing reproducible or deterministic environments within um, the data science community or data science context uh, derive from this. And it is no surprise that um, we have a lot of issues when it comes to, to managing our dependencies, managing our environments, our, all of our installs. Um, it is, th there is this XKCD comic uh, that pretty much reflects um, uh, the state of a lot of our um, installs. So there there is now one single canonical way to install Python packages or libraries, and there is not one single or a canonical way either uh, to manage your environments or your dependencies. So if we if we dive a bit deeper into this whole installation rabbit hole, and I'm not planning to do it because that is a whole different presentation and a whole different uh, topic on itself. Also from the PSF um, survey, we see that a lot of folks use the OS provided Python, whether they're using it on Windows, Linux, uh, or Mac OS, they're using things like apt-get, Jim, Homebrew, um, some of the folks directly install it from Python, they use Anaconda or, or, or they use Docker containers. Um, I, I particularly like the bottom uh, option there where it says, well, I just simply don't update my Python version. Because um, probably some folks don't even bother about updating and that is a massive problem, especially now that Python 2.7 has been completely, uh, basically was, has been killed and people have, to, all the projects have to migrate to Python 3. Um, now, if, if we look a bit more into the machine learning or the scientific Python ecosystem, uh, it's very, very vast. Again, um, it follows the tradition of Python that is a very versatile programming language and so is the scientific Python ecosystem. Uh, some of the most commonly or, or most used um, scientific Python libraries are NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, TensorFlow, and NumPy is basically this um, library, this package that holds together a lot of that other entire, um, all of the entire Python scientific ecosystem, and this is because NumPy was <laughs> basically tries to integrate the, the array data structure um, and allows us to do amazing things with tensors um, in multiple, well, tensors matrices across multiple dimensions. Um, but if you go into the documentation for NumPy or deep, uh, dive deep into its code, you're gonna find that um, NumPy uses OpenBLAST and Intel MKL and um, 
this brings certain difficulties later when we're working with, with other libraries. It's great, and but that's what it allows NumPy to handle all of these complex data structures. And since we have now learned that this environment management, libraries management, dependency subversion can be a nightmare in Python, um, folks do tend to go to different tools and alternatives to isolate their environment uh, based on a pair project basis, based on um, the environment that they're working on, whether it's their personal computer, or the cloud, or their production environment, or staging. Um, the most popular is VirtualEmp, but Docker has been steadily gaining momentum over the years. So at least, well, for the last six years, um, the Docker has been an option out there for everyone. More and more folks are starting to use it. And the reason why this happens is because Docker basically allows you to create or develop, deploy and run your applications uh, using containers. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to use this little image to identify or signal when I'm talking about a container. And the ultimate goal of containerizing your code or your application is to provide you a solution on how to get your software from one environment into another. So solving these issues where you need to you develop on your laptop, you need to move on to a test or staging or production environment, or simply to share your project with your colleagues or with your or the rest of the company, um, is where containers allows you to have a more um, a more reproducible environment. Because how many times have we had uh, this problem where you're developing a, a piece of code or an app and then it turns out that it works on your laptop? Um, but when you try and share with other folks within or outside your organization, you end up having issues like this where a certain module or a package is not. Uh, available. And if, if you just ship your application or your code by itself, how are folks um, meant to know what dependencies they need? And that just falls into a bubble. Um, what about different runtime environments? What about those folks that are working on different Linux distributions? And even when working with things like virtual Env or Anaconda or uh, poetry or pipem that are commonly used tools in the Python ecosystem, we still have issues where um, just seem to have sorted your installation, your environment, and you have import errors. Um, and, and packages like this, this snippet that I have here is directly from the NumPy library, uh, where where they actually walk you through on how you can solve these problems because it's so common. So the principle on working with containers is that you're not only shipping your application, but um, a lightweight standalone executable package uh, that includes the libraries, dependencies, the runtime environment, and all the configuration files that you need uh, to execute whatever is that you're de um, developing. So this all sounds like bliss, right? It sounds like a magical uh, thing that helps with all our problems um, from development to production. But are they really the one-stop solution for all of these problems? Um, I'm going to say maybe, but there is still a lot of cultures. There is still a lot of caveats. There is still a lot of issues that you will encounter uh, when working with Docker, especially for machine learning and data science. So the good thing, as I've mentioned before, is that um, it gives you a very good level of isolation. All of the isolation happens at the app level, uh, as opposed to virtual machines where the abstractions happen more at the hardware level. Um, 
And this allows you to have to not mess up with your local envir uh, environment if you're working with different dependencies, different versions of Python, different version of libraries. Um, and probably the best thing is that you can, and this is especially for um, production and for reproducibility, it allows you to keep everything, also your environment tagged and keep uh, control of the versions that you're, also, that you're using within your environment. Because all of the abstraction and the containerization, containerization happens at the app level, that means that you can have a Docker image and spin multiple containers out of this to do the, um, to do the development, to mount different volumes uh, without messing with the base Docker image. The path is unfortunately, um, Docker has a very steep learning curve if you want to get into some of the most um, advanced things that will allow you to really optimize your workflows. Um, and also, there are not many tutorials out there focused on ML or machine learning. If you go and do a search on the internet for Python and Docker, a lot of the tutorials or demos that are out there focus a lot on other applications for Python. Now, this becomes even a bit more convoluted as you see that the Python ecosystem, the scientific Python ecosystem is very, very vast and it's built in a kind of onion structure, it's layered. Um, so let's say if you are struggling to get the base components like NumPy, C Python, um, Python working, you're going to have a lot of lo other issues with other libraries that are further down in the hierarchical structure. And this becomes even more complicated because sometimes we need to, to access GPUs, sometimes we only have access to CPUs. We're working across multiple architectures, multiple operating systems, Python versions. Um, Deeper notebooks are also extremely familiar, are commonly used in machine learning, and that brings another set of caveats. We rely heavily on data visualization or on creating dashboards to, um, to share our insights with others, and we also build APIs to expose models sometimes. Um, so if you think about all of the tools and all of the resources that a data scientist or a machine learner has to use at a given time, these systems are can become very, very complex. So some of the most common pain points uh, for us are we have a complex setup, we have complex dependencies. We might need access to GPUs. Sometimes um, based on the kind of data that we're using, the approaches that we're using, we might need to parallelize code and I use um, high performance libraries like Dask, for example, we need to optimize our code. Um, also, there is also a, a lot of folks still, when you say machine learning, they straight away think that the output is going to be a model. Um, and that is not always the case. And even if it's a model, not everything can be exposed as an API. We have a very, very big high reliance on data, databases. Uh, that is our Base, that is our our prime um, our our prime material for us to do our job. Also, our projects evolve very very fast uh, during the research and development process. When we are trying different techniques, when we are trying to optimize our models um, based on certain accuracy measure, measures that we care about, and we also try a lot we also sometimes try a lot of libraries um, during that r d so also being able to update uh, those libraries add new libraries remove unused libraries is essential and again docker is complex uh, there is so like for for many years folks have um seen the data scientists or machine learners as a unicorn that knows how to do everything and um, there is a, a, a trend where a lot of folks are generalists, and these folks are very, very useful, especially in end-to-end -end case scenarios. 
but again, it's very, very hard to be to master every single tool. And again, depending on the kind of data that you're working on, the, the, the industry that you belong to, you might have even concerns about um, securing level access for your data or your model or your algorithm. For example, now that we are uh, dealing with COVID-19 and tracing, uh, a very important concern is how do you actually handle a data confidentiality? How do you make sure that data um, is only used for the, the purpose that is collected um, and we don't have malicious intents or malicious um, consequences down the line? Um, so again, we have, although the whole Python ecosystem has a big problem when it comes to environment managing and dependencies managing, uh, it gets a bit worse uh, for machine learning. It is a bit worse when you have to deal with uh, a lot of um, numerical specific tools. Um, and there are many, many, many threads on the about the folks that work in, in trying to solve the issues with Conda, for example, um, about this, like when do we decide um, or, or how we can make this easier or faster and, and work better uh, for the whole ecosystem. Again, I mentioned that a lot of tutorials out there are very focused on other applications of Python, for example, web apps. Again, in, in machine learning, not every deliverable is enough. Uh, we not always have something that folks can install, for example, like um, Google Maps or such. And again, not every deliverable out of machine learning projects is a model either. We heavily rely on data. And we see data from a very different perspective from folks that work on creating databases for, for customers or for businesses, um, retail businesses, for example. The way we see data and the way we manipulate data is fundamentally different. We have a mixture of wheels and compiled packages. And the reason is that many of our libraries um, that work with um, arrays and complex data structures, use Fortran underneath, use C, um, use Python, use C, use Fortran. And this also happens in other program languages like R, where some of the most popular um, scientific computing libraries also have underlying Fortran code. Again, depending on the kind of data that you work with, depending on where your team is, you have different security access levels for both data and software, because you don't want bad agents access confidential or highly identifiable data. Because the subjects and the objects of machine learning applications um, can be humans. And when you don't trade that human with enough security and privacy, very, very bad things can happen. And it's very rare that to have contexts in which a data scientist does absolutely everything from the research and development to um, the product, productizing the the result or whatever, putting it into the world and doing monitoring, doing DevOps, it's very, very hard to find a context where it is happening. And we normally have a lot of folks working on, on the machine learning product um, at a very different steps of, of, of the infrastructure. And this is because <laughs> Um, as I said before, multiple times, machine learning is more than a model. It's more than just a code. There are a lot of different things that play into, into it. But for us to be able to have reproducibility, and this is very, very important, uh, also for transparency, um, we have to remember that in data science or machine learning context, if one of these three pillars, whether data, code, or environment changes, everything changes. Um, 
I, I, I know that other folks that work in different areas of development will say, well, that, that is exactly the same for us. Um, but our data and our code is so directly linked um, that the reproducibility implications of not tracing either of these three pillars uh, can be disastrous. And this is why Docker gives us a, a very, very good opportunity. And the way we, we build Docker, Im uh, Docker images is using a file called Docker files, where we are basically providing a set of instructions to install software, do a configuration, pass environment variables. It's very, very similar to what you would do if you're using the shell, uh, shell scripting or, or bash. I am showing uh, an example of a Docker file that you're going to find in a lot of tutorials out there in the wild. And it's a bad example. And I'm going to be telling you why it is a bad example um, in the next slides. But let's first understand every Docker image uh, diverts or builds on another, um, another image. Basically, this is what it tells you what will have as a fold, whether it's based on a certain flavor of Linux, for example, Ubuntu base, Debian, Alpine. Then you provide a set of instructions that is actually going to install the different libraries, dependencies, configure your environment, and you provide an entry command that is specifically what is going to be executed when your container um, is started. And now the, the important thing to, uh, to keep here in mind is we have all of these instructions, um, but every time we provide an instruction to your Docker on your Docker file, it creates a layer. And it's pretty much like an onion, um, where the base, base image lies at its core and every instruction wraps around it. So the more instructions you provide, uh, the bigger and more bloated your image is going to be. Um, there are no ways to remove those intermediate layers because uh, they are fundamentally inside your Docker image. So keeping this in mind is going to be very, very important because also one of the great tools or advantages that Docker has is uh, the ability to leverage its cache. And for that, we have to be very, very smart on how we are passing these instructions, how we're installing dependencies, and the way, the way we move things from our local environment onto the image and install things is going to have a very, very high impact on how we're hitting this cache and how bloated our images are going to be. And probably one of the most crucial things when it comes to uh, creating your Docker image is choosing the best base image. I always recommend you, if you're building from scratch, if you're going to build your Docker image from scratch, always use the official Python images. If, if we just look here at this, this part in, the, uh, in, the, in my image, you're going to see that these images have very, very different sizes. You're going to, see, a lot of people are going to tell you to use Alpine because it's very lightweight. Uh, it is significantly smaller than all of the other images. But I'm going to tell you the pain uh, is not worth it. The reason why it's so slim is because um, a lot of stuff is missing. And you're going to spend a lot of time getting uh, your environment ready to work. I recommend using Slim Stretch, Slim Buster, um, because that gives you a, a nice compromise between enough libraries, enough work that you have to do. And as it is now, those are uh, going to have very, very long time support from Linux. So which means, um, so that means that you're going to be having security patches and performance patches coming in um, frequently. If, if you really don't need to build your image from scratch, which is, I'm going to say, most of the case, most of the case, you don't have to build everything uh, from a white canvas. Use the Jupyter Docker stacks. If you're going to be using some of the most commonly used frameworks or scientific Python libraries, 
uh, try using the Jupyter Docker stacks because the um, I don't know. I lost I lost sound on all of uh, things. Cool. Yeah, I couldn't hear anything on either side. Um, fab. So I don't know how much you missed of that. It was probably the last two, uh, the last two slides. Uh, but I would say, like, I think it's it's easy to follow from those slides. Be very smart about your cash. Um, make sure that your um, bot mounts that that you're not moving your data onto your container, but also um, make the most of binding mounts to your directories. If you want to, if you need to access data from your container, you can do that uh, without having to move it over. And again, always make sure that you have a non-root user. One of the um, good and bad things of Docker is that um, by default, you are a super user. And this is so that you can install system libraries using things like apt-get, um, but this is not what you want when you're working in a production environment or working with data. So always make sure that you have a non-root user to do all of your, um, all of your stuff. An advanced technique is using multi-stage builds. And I normally use this when I have a mixture of wheels and compile from source uh, libraries in the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and I normally split it into, um, into two images, one that is going to have my compiled uh, libraries and then the other one that is going to have um, everything that I need to run my code. And this means that in general, uh, my images are going to be small, but also Docker is going to be faster when it comes to building my, build, uh, my images. So basically, from this Docker file that I have on screen, I would use the same command that I normally use to, to build my image. Uh, with the difference that first, it's going to create this compiled image, compile all of my dependencies, and then move the, or copy the virtual environment into my final virtual, uh, my final Docker image, which is my runtime image. But it's not going to be named like so. Um, the image is going to be tagged as with the, the Docker tag that I specified. And this is uh, very, very useful, especially if you need to, to use um, GFortran or GCC for any of, of the libraries that you're installing at any point. Again, I've mentioned uh, some things that you can do to optimize your images and make them a bit more ready for uh, machine learning, but uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Again, if you don't need to build everything from scratch, use the Jupyter Docker stack, the folks are amazing. But there are also tools like repo to Docker um, that if you already have your content environment file or your requirement text or your PPM file, um, are you working with Dulia or R? I think you can have other languages, I can't remember. But if you already have those uh, files or configurations to, for your runtime environments, it makes it very easy to create a readily usable Docker container uh, out of it. And you don't have to worry about the Docker file. You don't have to worry about um, doing multi-stage builds or making sure that you're not a, a root user. Reboot to Docker does all of this for you and it's amazing. Again, if you are continuously using Docker images um, or containers and you're using it all the time, I always recommend uh, building your images frequently. But nobody wants to do this manually. Nobody wants to say to kind of remember to update everything or upgrade every month. Um, so delegate to your continuous integration tool. That way you only have to do it once if you need then to upgrade, for example, um, every Sunday or build and tag a, a new image every Sunday at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can do that and make sure that 
that doesn't have to be a manual process, but give enough context with the labels that I met, uh, that I've mentioned before, so that folks know who is still responsible if anything breaks down the line. So this workflow uh, will will blend in with other existing workflows, for example, where you're already using version control for your code. So when you create a new tag of your product or your application, then that also can uh, trigger the continuous uh, integration for your Docker images. But again, if you need to schedule a trigger, as I said, every Monday at 2 o'clock in the morning, because I don't know why, you can also do that. So then your image is going to be built uh, based on that automatically will be tagged and then you can pull, you can deploy, you can ship your code um, pretty much seamlessly. And these, uh, this integrates with all, all of the MLOps or data ops practices. So just to finish off, um, I'm going to give you my top tips. Uh, my top tips, which is rebuild your images frequently. If you are using them uh, on a regular basis, make sure that you're rebuilding them. So you can also get not, all, not only upgrade the libraries as you upgrade uh, locally, but also you get security updates for system packages. Never work as root, minimize the privileges. You always want to minimize the privileges, especially when it comes to network access. If you're working with highly uh, sensitive data, don't, don't use Alpine Linux, don't use the Alpine uh, Docker-based image. Always know what you're expecting, pin absolutely everything. Um, use Docker in conjunction with uh, other tools like pip tools, conda, poetry, or pipenv to always know what, what you're expecting. Leverage the build cache. One Docker file, one project. Sometimes we feel the need to create a massive Docker file that will have all of the dependencies and everything that we might ever need in any of our projects. No, um, use one Docker file per project that also allows you to have a very good granularity on environment variables, especially when you want to deploy things. If you have very complex setups or dependencies, if you need to compile code, if your image is very bloated, if you're moving into more complex uh, Docker workflows, use multi-stage builds. Make your images identifiable. And this is a practice that um, I, I took a, a few years ago and it makes a huge difference. Not only make sure that you are tagging with um, whatever version of your Docker image, but also if you tag with, um, let's say if it's based on Buster, uh, provide context there. Um, and if it's ready for tests or production as well, add labels, make sure that you're using a appropriate environment and build variables so you can differentiate um, the environment in which that is being used. Do not reinvent a well. Again, if you do need a very fine grain tuned Docker images and setups, use Ripple to Docker or the Jupyter stack. Automate, um, automate as much as possible. Once you have a, a, a setup that works for you, delegate to whatever your continuous integration and delivery tool is and use a linter. Most IDEs uh, will allow you to use a linter for Docker. I can tell you how many times having a linter has actually saved my life. So thank you very much. I am sorry for the loss of um, sound for a couple of slides. I, I lost it both ways, but thank you very much. I think we have um, time for questions or so. Maybe four minutes. I think you have a question in the Q and A. I still cannot hear. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, I was saying you have a question in Q&A. 
Yes, I have a question is, um, how should machine learning developers approach topics like CI and CD and the difference between development staging and production environments? Um, I touched a bit on that on the, um, on the presentation. So uh, sometimes we need different environment variables to be able to access to different databases or different environments. Make sure uh, that you're using that within your Docker images. Uh, when it comes to uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery, there is uh, you can use DevOps principles for machine learning and MLOps. And as much as you can automate for uh, for deployment, tagging, uh, testing, uh, those are always going to be worth it in the long run when you need to deploy stuff or, or put anything in production. Um, Oh, yes. Oh, that's tricky. Um, if your development does not have GPU, but production always uh, does have GPU, you're going to still need to have access to, to a GPU. Um, if you're using, for example, things like TensorFlow, I recommend you go and check their Docker images. They have uh, different architectures and different GPUs. Um, I can't remember. It, it should be in TensorFlow, Docker images or Docker samples. Um, have a look and how they approach that. And I think, and I just have one last one that is recommended mechanical keyboards, any keyboards. It depends on you. That's another rabbit hole. But I, I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you, all things open, for having me again this year.